Ave Maria. With the coming of evening, Jesus said to his disciples, Let us cross over to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him, just as he was, in the boat. And there were other boats with him. Then it began to blow a gale, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that it was almost swamped. But he was in the stern, his head on a cushion, asleep. They woke him up and said, Master, do you not care? We are going down. And he woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Quiet now, be calm. And the wind dropped and all was calm again. Then he said to them, Why are you so frightened? How is it you have no faith? They were filled with awe and said to one another, Who can this be? Even the wind and the sea obey him. Our most blessed Lord, having spoken at length with the multitudes that followed him, decides to depart, to go to the other side of the lake. This would be lake the Lake of Galilee. It's called the Lake of Galilee because it's in the province of Galilee. It's also called the Lake of Tiberias because the most prominent city on its coast was Tiberias. And it's also called the Lake of Gennesaret, which is a Hebrew meaning the Lake of the Wind or the Breezes. And the reason that's called Gennesaret, or the Lake of the Breezes, is because there are two great hills that um, along the shore. And these hills are quite close together. And so they are formed like a tunnel. And so when the wind pressure, when the pressure, the air pressure, builds up, it doesn't just disperse, but rather it enters between those two hills. And because of the contours of the hills, it gains velocity, it gains speed. And so it races through the tunnel and it strikes the sea. And immediately there are these storms on the Sea of Gennesaret, on the Lake of Galilee. It's not easily predicted when this will happen. Because, as I said, the air pressure builds up at the other end of the hills, and that, then there's some time elapses. So the fishermen, because that's who were around the lake, they were often in fear when they started to sail across. Anyway, our blessed Lord has been spending some time teaching. He's tired. And he said to his disciples, let us cross the lake. Let us go to the other side. Because in his missionary journey, our Lord would crisscross the lake, basically, so he could visit the various towns and villages all around. And so leaving the crowd behind, they took him just as he was. So there was no refreshment. The Lord is tired. He's been working all day. And they got into the boat. And we're told there were other boats as well. And so they are crossing. It's evening. It's getting dark. And of course, we know that when, as it, as it gets dark, the air cools. So you have this cooling of the air, and that's going to lead to air pressure. And that's exactly what happens. We're told it began to blow a gale, and the waves were breaking into the boat so that it was almost swamped. And the disciples knew the Lord had worked all day. He had been speaking all day. And don't think that speaking is not tiring. 
it's not tiring for those who say nothing. But for those who are speaking seriously, it is exceedingly tiring work. And our Lord was speaking about the most serious thing possible, our eternal salvation. And so he has fallen asleep, and the gale is blowing, the waves are breaking into the boat. The disciples don't want to, awake, to awaken him because he's tired. But things are getting out of hand because we're told that the boat is about to be swamped and they cannot take it anymore. Like Jonah, sleeping in the, in the, in the, in the boat below deck, in the middle of a storm, and the sailors all trying to save the, the boat, and they get desperate, and they happen to see him sleeping. They're angry with him. They say, are you mad? Get up, we're going down. Invoke your God. Have the disciples invoke the Lord. Look, Master, don't you care? We are going down. This is the end of the line. And our blessed Lord wakes up. And he does two things. He rebukes the wind and said to the sea, Calm, be calm, quiet now. Now, if we, if we know our scriptures well enough, this, is a prophes this was prophesied. For in, in Psalm 106, we are told, he spoke and summoned the gale, tossing the waves of the sea up to heaven and back into the deep. And they, the sailors, their soul melted away in distress. Then they cried to the Lord in their need, and he rescued them from their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper, and all the waves of the sea were hushed. They rejoiced because of the calm. He led them to the haven they desired. Let them then thank the Lord for his love and for the wonders he does among men. And this is exactly, this, this is a prophecy, and this is exactly what our blessed Lord does. What does he do? He stands up and he does two things. What is the cause of this storm? What is it? Who is causing the trouble? And the answer is the wind, the wind that rushed through the tunnel between those two, those two hills. That was what is causing the storm. And so what does he do? He rebukes it. He rebukes the wind and to the sea, be calm, quiet now. Imagine two boys, an older boy, bigger, stronger, and a younger boy. And the bigger boy is teasing, annoying, antagonizing the younger. What does the parent say? Rebukes the, the bigger boy, the one causing the trouble. He's rebuked. And the little one who is all in a fluster, he says, quiet, calm, it's over. Be quiet. And this is how the Lord treats the elements. And we're told there was a great calm. And we all know, because we live in an area that is subject to storms, hurricanes, we all know that whenever there is a storm or high winds and the sea is disturbed, after the wind has dropped, does the sea calm? No. It carries on beating the shores, making noise. The waves are still heavy, tumultuous. And eventually, it all calms down, but not so. Our Lord commanded, be quiet, and the sea is calm, quiet, absolute, a great calm, we're told. And then he said, he's rebuked the wind, he's calmed the sea, and now he's rebuking the disciples, he's rebuking us. Why are you so frightened? How is it you have no faith? Doesn't this apply to us? Why don't we have faith? Why don't we trust God? Is there anything that can happen to us that God has not foreseen 
and God has not permitted. And if God has foreseen it and permitted it, it can only be for our greater good because he loves us. God is love. He, God cannot will or want anything that will injure us or better still, that would hinder our eternal salvation. Because all the troubles of this life are necessary. They are necessary because they contribute to our salvation. St. Paul says, I consider the troubles of this world to be nothing compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. Our Lord, when he rose, said to the disciples, wasn't it necessary that the Son of Man suffer and so enter into his glory? Didn't he say that as well? St. Paul says, I rejoice in my sufferings because I'm able to make up what is still lacking in the sufferings of Christ. So why are we so troubled and worried and anxious about the daily difficulties that we have? On the contrary, we should rejoice in them because we know that through them the outer man is wasting away, but the inner man grows stronger day by day. We know that the things that we overcome only makes us stronger. So then, we need faith. We need faith in order to be able to pass through these troubles with a tranquil mind. The disciples are filled with awe. They hardly had the rebuke because they've seen this great calm. These are seasoned fishermen. They know the lake. They've grown up around the lake. They sailed across the lake. And they're in awe. How, how did he do this? Who is it? Who can he be that even the wind and the sea obey him? So if the wind and the sea obey him, why can't we obey him? Because he's given us the freedom to disobey is essentially the reason. But then if the wind and the sea, which are inanimate, they have no mind, if they obey his word, can't we ask him to speak to our hearts so that our hearts may learn to obey, that our hearts may learn to trust, and that we, like the apostles, can thank the Lord for his love and for the wonders he does among us. And the great wonder that he has done for us, St. Paul tells us, that we should reflect that if one man has died for all, then all should be dead. And the reason he died for all is so that we should live no longer for ourselves, but for him who died and was raised to life for us. So then God loves us and his son died for us, who should have been dead, but in dying for us and rising from the dead, he's given us life. So even here, now, today, we are sharing this life, his life, eternal life. All we have to do is to believe firmly and believe in, ask him to command our hearts to rest in all tranquility along his most sacred heart, to whom be honor and glory forever and ever. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Santa Maria.